When you're plugged into craft beer and talking with brewers about the technical stuff, the conversation will tend to veer into chemistry, biology, ecology, and agriculture. I personally believe brewing itself is an artistic expression of chemistry knowledge and biology knowledge, but also brewing skill. And you know, it's really arbitrary. You're, the flavor on your palate, that's you to yourself and you trying to bring out what's in your imagination. You know, the end result of all that good science is tasty beer. It's, it's really fun. Today's guest lives at the intersection of science and beer. Her name is Dr. Erin Berwald. She's a postdoctoral fellow, and her research focuses on bats and uh, their behavior and everything bat-related. <laughs> She's also an accomplished, respected brewer and home brewer who works at one of my favorite Saskatchewan breweries, Nokomis Craftales, located in Nokomis, Saskatchewan, which is just south of Saskatoon. I love their beer, and I'm going to ask her a few questions about their beer because I haven't had a chance to talk to them lately. I know that bats are responsible for eating pests like mosquitoes and a few other insects that damage crops. But I'd really like to find out what's new with bats and what we're still learning and what's coming up and how they might be connected to craft beer. Erin, welcome to the show. Very good to be here, thank you. So let's start at the beginning. What's mm -hmm. your background with bats? Oh God, I've been working with bats for about 20 years now. Um, Frankly, I started as an undergrad, so I was interested in conservation biology, so wildlife biology, and I've always kind of been a fan of the underdog. Um, and bats are fascinating. They are uh, really understudied, but they're really cool. And once you start working in them, I got a summer job 20-some years ago, and that was it. <laughs> I was completely hooked. And uh, suddenly I'm here. <laughs> it's taken me all over the world, and uh, yeah, now I'm in Nokomis. <laughs> Why are they understudied? Uh, a lot of people think that they're creepy, and so sometimes it's actually hard to get money to fund thing, to study things that people think are creepy. So grizzly bears and caribou and these big charismatic megafauna, we call them, these big sexy animals get lots of money to study them, but when you're little and people think of you as a pest, so you have them in your attic or you have them in your barn or things, and people think of them like mice, um, and so sometimes it's hard to get money. But um, the other part of that is they're really, really hard to study. They fly at night, <laughs> so they're hard to see. So you don't have a whole bunch of birders that can go out with binoculars and look at bats. Um, so it's very specialized, um, and they're hard to do. So not much is known, and if you want to know it, you might not get the dollars to do it. <laughs> what are some of the new things we're learning about bats? We're actually learning a ton of things right now. Um, I focus on threats to bats, so I'm a conservation biologist, so I study threats to bats. And one of the big avenues of research um, that's exploding right now is actually um, bat migration. So, for example, Saskatchewan has eight different types of bats that live in Saskatchewan. And five of those hibernate over the winter. So they spend the winter hunkered down, lower the body temperature and metabolic rate, and hang out for the winter. And those could be in caves or crevices or people's basements, things like that. But three of those species migrate long distances, so um, 2,000 some kilometers every year. They're flying south? Yeah, they're flying south. Yeah, they're, they're, I would say snowbirds, but they're snow bats. So they fly south. Um, we know that bats from northern Canada have been caught in Mexico. So they're flying these long distances, and along the way, they're encountering a whole myriad of threats. So a whole lot of things. Um, for these species, the biggest one's actually wind turbines. Wind turbines? Wind turbines, yeah, the ones that produce energy. Uh, they kill several, several hundred thousand of these bats every year during migration. And so it's getting to be a pretty big problem for these species. Um, bats live a long time, 30, 40 years. The oldest known bat we know is uh, 45, so older really? than me. Yeah. I would have guessed bats would live to like five to 10 years. I know, no, right? They're actually, there's a ton of research being done. Another avenue of uh, interest in research is aging. Bats seem to have these weird anti-aging properties. So they, um, live a very long time, way longer than you'd expect them to live. So yeah, mid 40s, and they only reproduce um, one pup a year. So they're not like mice, they live a short period of time, or like rabbits and have a ton of babies. They're more like flying grizzly bears or flying whales. They're actually more closely related to whales than they are to mice. But um, <laughs> they're 
fascinating. You can tell. Ask me any question. I'll go off in a rabbit hole. <laughs> you can't be flying if you have arthritis. <laughs> no, you have those big be. long wings. Yeah, and their hands. Their wings are, are their hands. They look just like all the same bones that we have, just extended with skin between them. Really, that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. When you're talking to people, what's the best way to sell them past the creepy factor of bats? Uh, how important they are. So there's lots of uh, crops that we wouldn't have if we didn't have bats. Like so, what? Uh, if you talk about South American crops or crops that are grown in the tropics, so you wouldn't have tequila without bats, for example. Bats are the primary pollinators of the agave cactus, and so you wouldn't have no tequila. Um, off, lots of flowers that bloom at night that are white, so vanilla is often pollinated by bats. Um, bananas are often pollinated by bats. Uh, there's a whole list of things, so cashews, um, almonds, like lots of these things. They rely on some daytime, uh, daytime pollinators, like bees and things, but very heavily on bats. Uh, we don't have those types of bats in Canada. We don't have a long enough season of things that flower. But what we do have here is a lot of pests. We have a lot of insects in Canada as you get farther north, and bats are the only thing that flies around at night and eats insects. So if you think of gypsy moths, you think of like earworm moths or all these other cro uh, crop pests, all these ca cabbage moths, all of these things, they fly around at night. Um, bats are the only thing that eats them. They're worth tens of billions of dollars to agriculture every year in how many pests they eat, and that's just not how many pests they eat, but then how many pesticides you don't have to put on. So without bats, you would have this explosion of insect pests that would eat crops, and you'd have to use a lot more pesticides to control that. So they're really important for a lot of these crops, and um, bats that eat fruits in tropical areas are the primary thing that disperses the seeds. So a lot of these forests... Through the guano. Through the guano. Mm -hmm. So they spread all the seeds around, so they're really, really important parts of the ecosystems. How long did it take us to kind of figure out how important bats were to all these pieces? Um, you know what? We're still working on it, actually. Um, we don't... It's one of those things, so because bat research is understudied and underfunded, to get money, you often have to tell people how important they are to money, to the bottom line. <laughs> so you have to say, this colony of bats... Like, so have you ever been to Austin? Or know that the big, K, the big bridge in Austin has two million some bats that live in it? It's a huge tourist boost now, but they had to do the math. You know, these bats eat this many insects, and you do that by catching bats and weighing poop and trying to figure out what they're eating. It's, every bat biologist has looked at bat poop at some point, which is sparkly, by the way. Really? Yeah, because insect bits, like insect wings and moth scales are sparkly. So if you crumble, I suggest everybody find some bat poop and crumble it. It's glitter, glitter poop. <laughs> it's fantastic. That's what, oh, we should have done a glitter IPA today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so the lots of people look into that, um, especially if they are seen as pests. One of the best things you can do is to turn it around and say, actually, this is how valuable they are. So a lot of um, cultures that may have a fear of bats. So a lot of the African cultures, uh, bats are bad luck. So they may try to eradicate them. But if we start saying to them that they're actually primary for, they're important for pollination and also seed dispersal and the regeneration of forests, they start to value them more. And that's our main goal. You can't you can't, a lot of times you can't conserve something or save it if people don't value it. And so one of the big things we do is just try to val put value on bats. And that's how we do it. How important are bats to craft beer? Uh, uh, pretty important. Uh, so one of the things that bats will eat are grasshoppers, for example. Mm -hmm. Grasshoppers can be huge pests. So you have these big outbreaks um, and they'll destroy barley. Um, so you have all of these things that can destroy barley crops or you have all these pests that can destroy hop crops. And there's been a lot of work done on looking at installing bat boxes in hop fields um, and try to reduce pests. That, um, you can actually use the guano. Bat guano is really incredible fertilizer as well. So it can actually be farmed and used as fertilizer. And it's, it's really, really good for hop fields, for example. Um, really high in potassium and high nitrogen. So it's, it's very good, but mostly we try to encourage um, that they're really good for pest control. So. And beer is mostly farming ingredients, right? So you need good barley, and you need good hops, and you need fewer pests to have those product products. So you need more bats. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was reading about in Texas, they have these bat caves, mm -hmm. and they, there were brewers there that were raising, yeah. selling beer for bats. Yep. yep, yeah, there's a couple breweries that work um, closely <coughs> in relation. So there's a big bat conservation organization based in Austin. 
And there's a couple breweries around the area that, um, so there's Freetail Brewing in San Antonio. I think it's in San Antonio. Um, and they do like beers for bats. And there's a few different groups that help fundraise for it. And it's pretty neat. <laughs> well, speaking of beer, of course. Let's drink today's beer. So one of my second favorite thing to talk about besides bats is beer, <laughs> so let's do this. Today's beer is Cerveza. Mm -hmm. It's by Rebellion. We actually haven't officially launched it as of this record date. I'm, I'm so lucky. So cheers. Cheers. I like the way this beer looks. It looks exactly how I would expect that style to look. Like really nice and bright and really nice and effervescent. So there's a ton of little bubbles in here. Well, okay, stop looking and start tasting. Have you had a lot of Mexican beers? Mm -hmm. I've had a few, of course, the big commercial examples, but there's been um, a few craft examples that I've had. I, it, actually, one of the most standout ones is one of the weirdest ones. Do you know Indeed Brewing in Minneapolis? I don't. It's really great uh, craft brewery in Minneapolis, and they do a, like a Mexican honey one. That is, re but it's a, it's a big boozy beer too. I don't remember what the percentage was, but <laughs> I think it's like an imperial something. It's, uh, and I was just in New Mexico talking about bats in New Mexico at a wind energy conference. And they have these kind of um, like Tex-Mex lagers. So they have these like, it's a good style for Tex-Mex food, I guess. But yeah, I like this. This is very nice. It's crisp. This is a hammock beer or fishing beer. This is like that perfect. I say, like, this is your lawn mowing hot day. We designed this to remind you of sitting on the beach in Mexico. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We want you to think, it's summertime. Yeah. I yeah. want to crush oh, yeah. a few of these without yeah. getting trashed. Oh, and it's 4.2. Yeah. It's That's nice. That's alcohol. a really nice, yeah. It's a nice ABV. Yeah. Dave That's, was saying. Um, mm, it's nice and dry. Like it's, yeah. Do you know what, like, malt and hop profile? I don't know. Oh, God. I didn't write it down. Dave sent me yeah. the flavor description. Mm. Um, it's so new, I just haven't mm -hmm. memorized mm -hmm. what the ingredients are. But mm -hmm. he was saying, because it's so low in alcohol, yeah. you yeah. can't really hide behind nope. anything. It's nope. going to show all its flaws. Yeah. So he said it's yeah. probably the most challenging yeah. beer he's ever brewed. Lager? It, is it lager? No, this is a nail. Is it a nail? Mm. Is it done with lager yeast temperatures or is it? I think it's done with ale yeast. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Because I would swear <laughs> it's a lager. Like it has a nice like... It challenges your expectations it's, of well, it does, and the simple beers. So I would expect what I would expect from it is like a limited malt profile. Like I wouldn't expect a lot because it's really light. So I wouldn't expect a ton of different mal malts in there. Like this doesn't have a lot of caramel or anything in it, mm -hmm. um, and pretty lightly hopped. So yeah, you can't hide behind. Like this is it. Yeah, nicely done. It's one of our least hoppy beers. Yeah, yeah. Um, over 500 pounds of fresh lime zest, so there's mm. no syrups, there's no uh, f artificial yep. flavors. Yep, yep. We didn't artificially color it or yeah, anything. Yeah, yep. It went through the centrifuge, just mm -hmm. like the rest of our beer, so we mm -hmm. don't filter, yeah, but yeah, we yeah. centrifuge. Yeah, yeah, which would contribute to that nice, bright, very, yeah. I could drink a few of these. <laughs> yeah. We're hoping this mm -hmm. one will be like our monster summer beer. Oh, um, yeah. It, hopefully it takes off and we can do it again next summer. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. It is a good summer beer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you recommend it to your friends? I would, actually. And so living in Nokomis is really funny because we have this small town of 400 and some people. The fact that there's a craft brewery there is a bit odd. Um, it works out great. There's lots of reasons that it's there. But we get asked often, what's the, what's the most um, lager-ish beer? It's not necessarily the words that they use, but what's the most like style X, Y, or Z? Or what goes best with clam? <laughs> And I always say our golden ale. Our golden ale with clam is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. I have done it, don't hold it against me. <laughs> and I will say, this would be really delicious. <laughs> I, this with the clam? Yeah, I, I could do this. <laughs> I hate, I know, Mark Heisey is gonna just be like, oh, Bearwald, what are you saying? But <laughs> this is a delicious beer, and I think that it's a beer that a lot of people could get behind. Like the craft folks could get behind it, and then non-craft folks, it's delicious. We have people come into the tap room and they're like, so can you serve me beer with Clamato? Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of stares at them like, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's funny. There's such a stigma behind that. But if you're drinking craft beer with it, it's better than drinking something else. <laughs> something else with it, right? Like, you're still supporting local. You're supporting the industry. And I think that there's a beer for everybody. And if you happen, if your beer that you happen to like is with clam, 
more power to you. <laughs> like we have people in town that only drink the golden with clam now. Well, they don't buy any of the mass-produced stuff, but that's that's what they drink. And they drink a growler a week. They nice little old lady comes in, gets a growler of golden a week, and drinks it with clam. We're not in the business yeah, of shaming people. Exactly. We're in the business of trying yep. to get people excited Ex about what we're doing. Exactly. Exactly. When people come into the, so I work at the Nicomas Tap Room on Saturdays. So if you come to lovely Nicomas to have some beer on a Saturday, it'll probably be me that serves you. And I always, I'm like, there's a beer for everybody. And if you have, and I will sometimes recommend our sour, people who find our sour, um, our summer kettle sour particularly, too sour, I'm like, oh, cut this with mango or guava juice, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic. And yeah. Usually when I'm pitching a sour, yeah. I say to people who've never had it before, are you a wine drinker? Yep. Do you like wine? Do you like sharp cheeses? Yep, yep. Is that kind of the wheelhouse of flavors you like? Yeah. Try a sour. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if they're a white wine and like, like a Pinot, uh, like a Pinot Grigio, like something like that's really crisp yeah. or a Sap Blanc, right? Like I don't, not a Chardonnay drinker necessarily. I wouldn't say, here, try the sour, but like that really crisp thing. And I would say, hey, you should try this with salmon or you should try it with something that'll cut the, um, the fat or the richness of it. But I usually do the same thing with our brown. If people come in and say, oh, I'm not a wine drinker. Like I'm not a beer drinker, I'm a wine drinker. I'm like, well, have you had our brown? Oh, that's too big, too dark. I'm like, just... Do you like a Merlot? Do you like that chocolatey sort of character? And guaranteed, they'll, well not guaranteed, I don't wanna put money on it, but like they will walk away with a brown. Yeah. yeah. If, if they tell me they're a red wine drinker, I push them in the direction of stouts and yeah, porters. Yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah, me too. And well, come on, like the Nokomis Brown is pushing a porter. I would say your Nokomis Brown was my favorite Nokomis mm -hmm. beer mm. until Cascadian Dark Ale. Oh my gosh, the CDA is so good. That Cascadian Dark Ale is so good. It's my favorite. Like start to finish. <laughs> yeah. It evolves as you're drinking yeah. it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it tastes better when it warms up. I agree. I agree. There's more depth to it when it warms up and you get some more of that piney, dank hops. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get as much of that sharp roast. Mm -hmm. and it kind of mellows out a little bit more and it gets more complex. I don't want to say astringent, that's not the correct nope. word. Yeah. Uh, when it's too cold, mm -hmm. it has, it's just lacking those extra pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it warms up, boom. So yeah. I would actually hold the glass in oh, my yes. hand and let it warm up yep. and roll it. Yeah, yeah. And it was my beer that I would go to when it was in the tap room. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I'll get one of those to it, please. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice one. They did a good job. So they've done um, black IPAs in the past, and but they are embracing the Part of it is Brandon, um, who is my husband, who's Brewer at Nicomas, uh, has a PhD in biology as well. And so <laughs> names are important, right? And, he, and it always bugged him that black IPA, you can't have a black pale ale. So um, this was, there's the move to change the name to Cascadian Dark <laughs> Ale. And so they went with a suite of hops that, that to me it really evokes that Cascadian area, that Pacific Northwest sort of, that dank, those, really nice piney resiny sorts of flavors but then with that roast too it's just damn it's so yeah, good yeah it's like coffee yeah it's so good coffee yeah, and hops yeah. which is two yeah. things i like yeah 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 but they One did a nice job we of balancing it about, we couldn't agree in the tap room hmm. dave's like it's a it's a friggin black ipa they're calling it cascadian mm -hmm. i'm like i don't know the difference yeah yeah <laughs> it's and I, and from my understanding of it is it yeah so in the bjcp guidelines i like black ipa is kind of a thing but again it's that and it may, be, it may be pedantic, but <laughs> names matter. Um, so, it, and again, like for Brandon, it was very important. Uh, the black pale ale is just wrong. <laughs> but, but also embracing kind of where the style originated is from that Cascadian region. So, so many good things come from that Pacific Northwest. And so much of Nokomis' style are these Pacific, classic Pacific Northwest style beers. Like our pale ale is a classic Pacific Northwest. So is our IPA. And now the Cascadians are really embracing that. Yeah, you guys kind of yeah. lean into that piney. Oh, yeah. And like more earthy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Maybe earthy is the wrong word, but well, piney. I would, yeah, I would, give it, I would give it some earthy. Yeah, mm -hmm. like for me, our pale, I get a lot of... Uh, I want to say tea sorts of notes, like from our pale. And so most of ours tend towards not the big juicy bombs, right? Like, but they have more of that. Well, I think it goes a bit with our brand of like the sense of place, and so that earthiness, right? And, and I think that there's a lot of that in there. I like what you guys are putting out. I'm yeah, never sad too. to try Nakoma's beer. Yeah, no, like, I it's, know. it's never like, oh, this thing is fucked up or flawed or there's off flavors. It's either yeah. I really really love it or yeah. eh, it's not for me, but it's not bad. It's yeah. 
Yeah. It's a good representation of a style. Like, I, I hate Saison's. I, yeah. I fucking hate Saison's. Yeah, yeah. You'll never find a yeah, Saison yeah. that yeah, I yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. But I had your guys' Saison. I'm like, okay, this is what which, a Saison should taste like. Which Saison? It was DH or something. I can't remember. I don't know. If, I don't think we've ever made a Saison. Was it not a Saison? Something mm. funky you guys did. Recently? No, not recently. Oh, like um, within the last year and a half or so. No, I don't think. Somebody else's back. Saison? It might have been somebody else's Saison because we didn't do. So many beers. The weirdest, the weirdest thing, because I don't think, because. So Brian and I have been there two years um, and we've not done a Saison in that time. Oh no, it was. Um, you guys did that Nordic one, didn't Ooh, you? Ooh, the Nordic farmhouse? That was too fucked up for me. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's a weird style, right? So it's not, it has nothing to do, it's not associated at all with a French or a Belgian farmhouse. Like, that's, it's not a Saison in any way, shape, or form. There we go. That's, Definitions yeah. matter. Oh, yeah. See, yeah. Names <laughs> yeah. matter. Definitions. Uh, as, a, as a biologist, <laughs> these, like, dichotomous keys. If this, then this. It goes this way. No. And so a Nordic farmhouse is an entirely different style. It was too weird for me. Yeah, no it, offense. It's, well, it's a weird beer, right? It's a no-boil beer. That's that's weird in and of itself. I had a Norwegian guy come in the yeah. tap room, yeah. sit down beside me. He's yeah. like, I love this beer. This yeah. is my childhood. This is yeah. like my life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so there is this, with these weird strains of um, this Norwegian yeast, which I can never pronounce. Apparently it r- rhymes with quake. Quake? I, I don't know. My uh, Norwegian grandmother is probably rolling over in her grave. <laughs> but <laughs> I think I read that it's pronounced quick. I have no idea. I think that's what I remember it no being idea. pronounced as, quick. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, but yeah, fun stuff. It's it. Well, it is fun, and it's uh, most of my days all day are science. I do, and can be frankly kind of depressing. So what I what I do most of the time is I'm trying to understand why wind turbines, so uh, why so many bats are killed at wind farms, and what do we do to prevent that? Because green energy is great. Wind energy is great. Climate change is real. We need to reduce our fossil fuel uh, consumption. One of the best ways to do that is to look to renewables, look to wind energy. And Saskatchewan's windy as fuck. Wind energy is a good thing on the landscape. But if it kills a whole bunch of bats, bad. It's self-defeating. It's exactly. So you're trying to, and it, I feel bad for the industry because they're trying to do a good thing, but then this one bad side effect. Is there a way to scare away bats or yeah. to not plant the yeah. machine, plant, build yeah, the machines in their uh, trip? migratory paths well, or are they just everywhere and well, that's what we're trying to figure out so here's we don't even know if bats use migration routes so this is a little we actually know uh, so my master's student right now also an Aaron Aaron Swartvegger she was working with SAS Power over the last couple of years trying to kind of figure that out um, huge big project all across Saskatchewan trying to figure out where these migratory bats are going and are there places that are some places that are better than others um, it looks like they really like eastern Saskatchewan versus western Saskatchewan, which makes sense if you're a bat that roosts in trees. <laughs> you're not going to go where there's not a lot of trees. You're going to go where there's more. So, um, so potentially trying to build more facilities in the western part where there are fewer trees and therefore fewer bats, therefore fewer bats available to be killed is probably a good thing. Um, but there's also a lot of labs all over the place that are actually looking for things like deer whistles. Like how many of us in Saskatchewan have deer whistles on their cars, right? This, something that produces an ultrasonic warning system. Uh, lots of people are studying those. How can we produce, uh, we are rebelling, can we produce Ozzy Osbourne and blast Ozzy Osbourne at bats and say stay away from here, but in a white noise, high frequency sort of thing, right? Like can we produce something that's bad for bats? So it would irritate them, but it not would irritate them. Kill exactly. Them. Exactly. Not bite their heads off. Right? But like irritate them and say this is a bad space to be. They can't um, they can't echolocate, so these bats use sonar to find their food. And if they can't do that, then why would they be in that space? So that's a lot of people are trying to produce those sorts of things. It's highly complicated and very technical and there's been mixed results. Turns out bats are incredibly smart, which I've known for years, but and they're also very curious. So you produce something new on the landscape like that and they come in to investigate it. Oh, what's this noise? Um, and so that hasn't always been great. Let's just attract bats to turbines is not awesome. So it's like a three-year-old, don't touch that. Well, now I got to Now I got to. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> so... Uh, but there's lots of people researching that, um, and lots of uh, lots of people trying to figure it out. Right now, we're working towards let's put turbines in places where there aren't as many bats as other locations, and hope that helps. And then the next step is, can we? Um, so we know that we can shut turbines off at certain times of the year and in certain weather conditions, and that reduces the number of bats killed. 
So most bats are killed in autumn migration. So here, that's like mid-July to mid-September. Um, that's like 90% of the bats that are killed are killed in that window. Okay. Oh yeah, it's during my, it's pretty limited. It's during migration. And uh, it's only at night because bats fly at night. And it tends to be mostly when wind speeds are low. So when wind speeds are below about five, six meters per second, most of the bats are killed. So you analyze all those conditions. You mm -hmm. say, let's lock down the turbines exactly. or slow them down? Yep, you shut them off at that time, at, under those conditions. At night, in autumn, when the wind speeds are low. And if the and wind speeds are low, they're not producing much electricity anyway. So And SAS Power is keen to collaborate with your team mm. because they don't want to be seen as exactly. the guys who killed a bunch of friggin' bats exactly. who are good yeah, yeah. for the economy to the tune of $10 billion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, most, as I said, most people who go get into wanting to build wind energy are trying to do good. And in this case, SAS Power is trying to do good. They're trying to move towards a bunch of renewables, um, which is fantastic. Let's burn less coal, guys. Um, corporate social responsibility. Corporate social <laughs> responsibility, environmental. <laughs> um, and so they approached us. They're like, hey, you know, we're going to be building a lot more wind energy in the next several years. Help us do it better. And so that's what we're trying to do, which is great. It sounds like a plug for SAS Power, but I was just very impressed with how proactive they were and just really like, we need to understand this. And so, yeah, that's what we've been trying to do. Full disclosure, mm -hmm. like half my family works at huh. Power. <laughs> well, there's a crown corporation, right? It's a good yeah. job. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it's good. So can you create like bat house highway where you have certain locations where bats would say, learn or know, yeah. hey, I can go here and yeah. it's safe and I can find food and then shelter. Yep. And maybe they stick away from power generation areas or high risk areas? Yeah, that's, uh, so we are trying, we are working towards something like that. Unfortunately, the species that are killed at turbines aren't ones that use bat houses because they're not, uh, they're not big colonies. They roost in like cracks and crevices or just hang in the leaves uh, of trees. But what we're trying to do is from a continental scale, so a massive undertaking is try to understand if there are migratory routes and if we can set some of those migratory routes kind of aside as a no build zone. The can we actually, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Yellowstone to Yukon corridor. It's a huge, a so a huge big biology um, push to create a corridor that is limited development things from Yellowstone Park all the way to the Yukon. So, so big movements of big animals. Um, so grizzly bears are, big, are a classic example. They're kind of their flagship species. So they're big sexy species that they can sell this around, right? So we're trying to think of something like this as well. Like are there areas? So if eastern Saskatchewan is better to fly through than western, maybe we build less there and try to, where can we connect that to? And can we make this um, friendly corridor? Um, and then have areas where there's more building. And then hopefully the bats, learn, they live a long time, right? So they have high potential to learn. Can they teach each other? Or like, do they mimic? Like, bumblebees can teach yeah, yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah, Well, so there's something in um, the bat world called, and it's not just the bat world, but the bag of chips effect. So you, Bats can hear each other feeding, and they will go to where they hear each other feeding. So echolocation is very loud. These animals are yelling, like screaming their heads off. But in frequencies we can't hear, but their friends and neighbors can hear them. So what, kind of what we're hoping is that we can maybe create, we can use that sound to say, hey, come over here, this is high quality habitat. So rather than producing ultrasound that's bad for bats, we can produce ultrasound that's good for bats, that sounds like feeding bats, and pull them and then not build there and kind of have this, uh, this is great, woo, look at all these trees we're planting for you, look at all this stuff. Um, so Bat we're hoping, beacons. Exactly, we're hoping we can do something like that, but that's still many years on the road, there's still so much to learn, which is incredible. So who do we have to talk to to get this kind of going? I mean, if it's good for farmers, mm -hmm. that's a yep. no-brainer in my mind for yep. Saskatchewan. Well, I agree, right? Um, what we always do is this grassroots approach with bats, right? It's always, I do these things all the time, right? Like, let's talk about how awesome bats are. Let's like, uh, the Science Center has a big bat release they do every year, and that's coming up in, phew, next month. Um, they've overwintered some bats, and they do this big, four or 500 people come out to watch the bats fly away. So that's what we need to do. And, and then it's also just leveraging dollars. It's like, hey guys, let's do studies on how many insects they eat, and let's make it a priority to protect them. If people are scared of bats, mm -hmm. is there a way to communicate to them that maybe they're not so scary? Mm -hmm. Is it okay to maybe catch a bat in a net and then put them outside if they're in your house? Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. okay if you touch them? Should yeah. you wash your hands? Do, do not rabies? touch bats. Do not touch bats. Do not touch bats. 
Good advice. Yep, that's, I can say all these wonderful things about bats, um, but bats are wild mammals. Yeah. And like any wild mammal, if they get scared, they will bite you. Um, and sometimes bats have rabies, and rabies is not curable. Rabies will kill the fuck out of you. So you can quote me on that. Uh, it's Fewer bats have rabies than skunks or raccoons have rabies, but um, if you come in contact with a bat, the chances are that it's sick is actually high because they don't want to be near you. So don't handle bats. Um, but if you do wound up in a bat at your house, don't kill it right away either because there's a good chance it's not sick. What we always say is shut all the lights off, open all the doors and windows. They can figure their way out. If that doesn't work, then get your big oven mitts out or get your welder's gloves. There's lots of welders in Saskatchewan. Get your big farm equipment gloves. Get those things out. And when it lands, you can grab it and throw it out. But you just don't want to get bit. How do you shoo it? <laughs> uh, you can shoo it gently with towels. Towels. Towels work. Don't use tennis rackets. I hear that a lot. Um, or baseball bats. People think it's really funny to tell me stories about baseball bats and bats. Yeah. Why would they hit a bat with a baseball bat? I think it's funny, I guess, but whatever. Um, yeah, you can shoo them out, mostly by just shutting everything off and creating a space for them to find their own way out because um, they really don't want to be in your house at all. Uh, there's no food there. There's no food there. They probably got lost. Most of the time, the bats that wind up in people's houses are young, dumb teenage bats. Or they've just learned to fly and they're not so good. And they may have chased something in or they may actually be living in your house but didn't go out the right way. Um, and so it's usually juveniles that get, um, that get into people's houses. And then they're the ones that may be the most important because they're going yep. to be they're able to have yep. pups the next exactly, year. Exactly, exactly. And those are the ones that are going to live 40 years, right? So we need those ones. But yeah, so what I would say, just don't, don't be scared, but at the same time, treat them with respect, right? You wouldn't just like go up to some random skunk, <laughs> skunk and be like, hey, or whatever, right? Like they, they will get scared. Of course I would massive thing coming at you probably with bright lights and it's scary a skunk might walk away though if you like, <laughs> made a bunch of noise yeah. but a yeah. trash panda is just going to look at you and like flip you the bird <laughs> mm -hmm. oh my god trash pandas are so great <laughs> uh yeah does noise scare away bats or are they just like Pfft. noise does because their hearing is really sensitive so it it, it can scare them away because it makes the space uncomfortable for them and their own echolocation becomes less good mm -hmm. and so um, they don't want to be in that space but mostly it's just let them find their own way out or shoo them or uh, you can like, like again, oven mitts, big gloves, because they will land, they have to land and you can grab them pretty easily, but be well prepared. My little guy, he's eight, mm -hmm. he's obsessed, he's like mm -hmm. into science and yeah. biology. And just that, that age that, is great, hey? Dinosaurs it, and everything. Mm -hmm. And he's obsessed with chickens right now. <laughs> what's, Dinosaurs basically. What's something I can take home mm -hmm. to him about bats that would be really useful? Um, well, so if he's into dinosaurs, here's what's cool about bats, is that bats just appear in the fossil record. I think this is cool anyway, but I'm super geeky. There's no proto-bat. So there's not like, oh look, wings are starting to develop. Oh look at that, isn't that cool? It's no bat bat, which is, I think, very cool. Unusual. Yeah, it's because usually, usually you see the evolution of things, and but we just don't tend to have that. It, some of it is the, those tissues are hard to preserve. Um, but the other thing I think is really cool about, about bats that kids really like is that bats use echolocation. So they use sonar, which is really cool, right? Uh, dolphins use sonar. A lot of whales use sonar. Um, Batman in the movie used the sonar, used the thing, right? So that's cool. And they also um, fly by the power of jazz hands. What do you mean? So their wings are made out of hands, right? And so they have to just like, yeah, jazz hands. <laughs> you get it. <laughs> It's, this is a podcast. They can't see us. But we're jazz handing. We're jazz handing hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that always. Um, and, the, and the other thing, so a lot of the bats have these giant ears, and their ears are the same size as their bodies. And their so, ears are the same size as their bodies? Yeah. So a lot of these like big-eared bats, you can look up, their ears are the same size as their bodies. So if you measure their body from like their neck to their butt, it's the same size as their ears. And so when I give talks to kids, I like to get the kids up and be like, if you were a bat and measure their body and then give them the giant ears, that's always very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the last cool kid bat fact that kids like is that bats eat their body weight in insects every night. So that would be like, well, I'm not going to do the math on this, but 
that would be a lot of quarter pounders I would be eating, for example, right? Like, and so telling kids that, like, how much do you weigh? That's this many quarter pounders, or this many cheeseburgers. They're like, what? Like, about every single night eats their body weight in insects. That's a lot of freaking insects. So if my little guy's like 58 pounds, yeah. like they just ate 58 pounds of mosquitoes, buddy. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's a lot. So you can see how that adds up to be worth billions of dollars to agriculture, right? Because like every bat every night eats his body weight. Am I allowed to open another beer? Uh, why don't you take those home with you? Oh, yes. <laughs> Good plan. I kind of brought these with the Good. intention that you would take them Good. home. Okay. With the hope. Mm-hmm. Hopefully she likes the beer and mm-hmm. let's take it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where can people find more information about your work and kind of help out if they want to get involved with what you're doing? Oh, that's a good idea. You know, um, <laughs> I really need a website. That's a great reminder, actually. Uh, but most of what I do, if you're interested in, in bats and wind energy specifically, um, the Google is great. There's a lot of information. Not all of it. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. But there's um, a lot of good stuff on Bat Conservation International, which is the site based in Austin. Um, they're a fantastic organization. In Canada, we have Neighborhood Bat Watch or batwatch.ca. Um, there's a ton of information about local bats, and you can actually log. If you have a colony of bats that live in a bat house, you can actually log that colony, and it's kind of a citizen science approach. So, batwatch.ca is good for that. And Saskatchewan, we have a network of those people. Um, and those are kind of the best tools and best resources that I can think of. Like Bat Conservation International has a ton of stuff like how to build a better bat house, where to put the bat houses, all of those sorts of things, and how you, what you um, can do if you find a bat, and all of those sorts of things. It's a good resource. Erin, mm-hmm. I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. It's awesome. You know, like I said, bats and beer, that's what I get to talk about anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you come back in the future. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about bats, more about beer. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll, maybe I'll, next time I'll bring some like Nakoma stuff or I'll drag Brandon with me. That'd be deadly. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. <laughs> I featured you guys a few times in the podcast. I know. Yeah, yeah. I heard you guys talking about the CDA and the, and the weird Nordic farmhouse. <laughs> I'm a big fan of CDA. Oh, it's so good. If you're listening to the show and you haven't had the CDA yet, is it still available? It is. It's still, so uh, it is. I think they actually canned the last batch of it pretty recently. Get your, get your hands on oh, it. Oh, get it. Yeah, yeah. Get it. Yeah, get it. It's so good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Rebels, thank you for tuning in this week. As you know, we're now in the second season of the podcast, and we're working hard to grow organically by word of mouth. My promise to you is we'll never put up a paywall, and we'll never pay for clicks. We'll never subscribe to get fake audience members. We want our audience to be real. The only thing we ask of you is that maybe think about telling one friend about the podcast. Just one person who you think might be interested in learning a little bit more about craft beer and the people that we bring on the show each week. That would make a huge difference to us. As always, if you want to find the latest news about Rebellion Brewing, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped. I'm going to include links to everything that Aaron was talking about today on the show. Thank you for joining the Rebellion.